great to see uh you know there's so much interest in nature from around the around the country so um look i have a few thank yous um first of all thank you to the national parks and wildlife service who provided um the carry bias in ourselves with the license to be able to run these uh webinars for such large numbers of people um so a huge thank you to them and thank you to all the partners that support the two by the, the two unesco biospheres um you know it's important that um you know, we, we get their support to, to be able to look after and protect our biospheres. And I think, Eleanor, you're going to tell us a little bit about what a biosphere is. And I know some of you may have already seen this and it's fine. Um, it'll be just a quick update. OK, so yes. Eleanor, over to you. It's like two minutes, so it's not too fast or it's not too it's not too much to take time to take up. So I'm just going to try and hopefully my screen is sharing and hopefully that comes up nice and big. So we are going to join more aid in a few minutes for how to be a wildlife detective. But first I'm going to just give you a quick introduction to what a UNESCO biosphere reserve is. So myself and Dean work in the two Irish biosphere reserves. Now a biosphere reserve does always include an element of nature conservation. So right in the center, it's all about how we protect habitats and species that are really important. The biosphere reserves are looking at a wider issue than that. So it's not just about nature conservation. It's also about the people that live in those areas, the kind of uh, businesses and jobs that you have in those areas and how we use those areas for recreation. So we like to say it's about how nature and culture connect. Now I said they're UNESCO Biosphere Reserves and that's the designated body, but UNESCO stands for United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Just in case you get asked that in a quiz now, you'll know the answer. So as I said, the biosphere reserves have nature conservation at their core. So they have three different zones. So the center zone, the green section in the middle is called the core area. That's where we focus on conservation. And then in the blue area, the darker blue, just around the green area in the center, that's called the buffer zone. And that's where we start to see activities taking place that are environmentally sustainable. And then in the transition area, that's where we generally have more of our towns and our villages and in Dublin's case, a capital city. And that's where we start to encourage people to interact with nature in a sustainable way and start to learn more about the kind of habitats and species that we're trying to protect in the core area. So worldwide, there is 714 UNESCO biospheres all over the globe. But in Ireland, we only have two so far. We've got Dublin Bay over on the west coast, or sorry, on the east coast. I'm going backwards with my directions this morning. Uh, and then Kerry over on the west down here in the south. So Dublin Bay Biosphere is based, as I said, right here around our capital city. It's one of very few biospheres that actually have a capital city inside the biosphere area. So it's really important and it gives us an excellent opportunity to explore how that can interact with nature conservation. Here's a, like a lovely map of the Dublin Bay biosphere that shows you how some of those businesses and those nature conservation areas can interact. So in the center, you can see Bull Island, which is a nature reserve. And then of course, you've got big businesses like Dublin Port and all the harbors. And of course, the city right in the center. Now, where's the Kerry Biosphere Reserve? So we don't actually have a coastline in the Kerry Biosphere Reserve, although Kerry has a huge coastline. Our Biosphere Reserve is a mountain biosphere reserve, and it's right in the centre here around the McGillicuddy Reeks and Killarney and includes the Killarney Lakes. So here's a better map of that so you can see the grey, the red area in the centre is the core area, and that's actually the same as Killarney National Park. So that's where we focus on a lot of conservation efforts for habitats and species. And then the brown area outside of that is parts of the McGillicuddy Reeks and the Paps Mountain Range. And a lot of that is farmed land as well. So we're working with farmers to protect habitats in those areas too. And then the green area is the transition area. Our biggest town is Killarney, but we have a lot of small villages as well where people are interacting with the Biosphere Reserve and helping us work towards conservation and sustainability. So I'm going to pass over to Moray now, and we're all going to learn how to be a wildlife detective. So I'm going to stop sharing Actually, and hand I, over. Can I jump in first? I just want oh, to of course. Uh, Sorry, tell Dean. a couple, yeah. of couple of things, uh, just uh, share about some of the other programs that we're running. So here we go. Um, I have a couple of slides here. Now I need to slow down, I know. Um, so it's far, part of our education and communication program. We're running this series of homeschool webinars. This is the second series. 
Um, and as I mentioned, we've an, we've another series um, that we ran in March, and they're all available to view now on the Kerry Bias for YouTube channel. Um, and these webinars will also appear on the Kerry Bias for YouTube channel once they've been uploaded. So um, and obviously completed. So obviously this is um, how to become a wildlife detective. But we've two more in the series coming up. Another program that we're running um, is the Dublin Bay Biosphere Award, and you can see the badge there that you can earn. And it's a three part program that's been developed with Scouting Ireland. We're asking young people to immerse themselves in nature, um, to get outside and be active and use all your senses to see and hear and feel and uh, smell and even if possible, uh, taste what's around you in certain circumstances, to understand the processes that are going on in. Maraid's going to be teaching us about some of those processes today. And then uh, the third part of the program is to take action, to do either raise awareness about your local biosphere or one of the biospheres in Ireland, and or to do something to help protect it. So that's one of the other programs that we're running. And we also are running um, a Young Nature's sorry young nature bloggers program and so we're asking young people to um write about nature um and tell us a little bit about that and have some connection to one of the two biospheres here in ireland and um, more details are available there on our website so i wanted to share that with you just in case you have um any you know young people that are interested in um sharing their love and passion for the biosphere and for nature okay so i'm going to stop sharing and we're going to get to the main event, which is Maraid, and over to you. So first thing is just Jeeve Gugat Bina Toy Gael Skull and Timpa Natira. Um welcome to everybody in Gael Skull and us. So by my Gusaj Kupi Fokalas Gael, I'll be using few words in Irish. Um I always like to give the Irish name for animals as I go along. So Gronyo is hedgehog or Irarua is the red squirrel. Um it's lovely to learn a little bit about the Irish. For our native species. So here we go. Who is ready to learn a little bit about the wild animals that are around us in Ireland, all around the country? Okay, and remember I warned you last week, and those of you who weren't on last week, teachers, if you don't want to learn about animal poo, this is the wrong place for you because we're going to be talking about it and looking at it. Okay, so today is about being a wildlife detective. First of all, before we can figure out how to be a wildlife detective, we need to know what wildlife is around us, okay? We have so much wildlife, whether you're in Kerry or Sligo or Longford or Roscommon or Dublin. What's out there? Lots. This little guy is the red squirrel on Irarua, and he is our native Irish species of squirrel. Isn't he beautiful? He's tiny. He's got big ear tufts. Most of us get to see the gray squirrel, but only some of us get to see the red squirrel. And he is absolutely lovely. This guy, the hedgehog, for those of you who like hedgehogs, there is a hedgehog survey. And teachers, there's a cool thing that's just starting this month. So maybe Google National Hedgehog Survey and there's a few fun things that you can do in your schools, okay? The lovely badger. Many of us don't get to see the badger, but we do have them in our cities, in the countryside. They have beautiful long snouts and I'm going to be talking about those in a minute. Those snouts give us some of the tracks and trails that we'll be looking for, okay, in a little while. So our badger is an omnivore, which means he eats everything. He mostly likes to eat slugs and snails and worms, but in the autumn he'll eat berries. The fox on Shunach or on Madaru and Nach will shake a in Erfad. Isn't he beautiful? So on Shunach, this time of year, they're having their little cubs. And there are so many cubs around the place. And what they're doing, the mums are staying home to feed the cubs because they are mammals and the mums feed them milk. The dads are out getting food and bringing it home to feed the mums. Isn't that just lovely? So believe it or not, the fox isn't a carnivore. Most of the time when I go into schools and I say, what do foxes eat? And everyone says, chickens. Well, I suppose they would eat a chicken if you had chickens in your backyard. 
but they are omnivores too. They eat mushrooms and slugs and frogs and snails and berries and chickens and batter burgers and chicken nuggets and all the food that we like to eat. I just thought I'd show you this. We never think of our amphibians when we're talking about our wildlife. Amphibians that live on water and land. We have two in Ireland. We have the common frog, which isn't so common anymore because it needs wet areas for its frog spawn and its froglets and its tadpoles. But it also needs dry land when it is an adult. We don't have too many wet areas left because we keep building on them, don't we? So we're going to be doing a little bit about what we can do to help our frogs. These dudes are actually, sorry, we have three amphibians. What am I talking about? This funny looking guy with all the warts is a natterjack toad. Now, most of you will never get a chance to see him because he's only found on special nature reserves in County Kerry and County Wexford. And this guy is the newt, the smooth newt. And you're saying, what are you talking about, Mairead? I never heard of such a thing. They live in Ireland too. And they're a bit like the frog. They live in water and on land, okay? Now you're Mairead, you've totally lost the plot. What are you talking about lizards? We're in Ireland, we're not in Spain. We have a lizard in Ireland. It's called the common lizard and again, I don't think it's that common because do you did you ever see one? There's, they're very hard to see. They like to hang out where there's lots of stone walls where they can kind of bask in the sun because they don't make heat inside their body like us. They need to take heat from the sunshine. So they need to just hang out in the sun on walls. We have another kind of lizard in Ireland. It looks like a worm or it looks like a snake. It's called a slow worm. Now it's only found in the west of Ireland, around the Burren. It's a legless lizard and it's not native to Ireland. It was introduced into Ireland. So we really don't want to be encouraging this guy because he eats all our native little fellas. I'm gonna show you a little video about the common lizard on Bull Island in Dublin, because I know you don't believe me that we have them, but really and truly we do. To find it. Come on, where are you? Okay, what I'm going to do, sometimes my videos disappear and I just don't understand where they go. Wait a minute. Aha, here he is. Now, let's go. Uh, these are our only native reptile, our only uh, native land-based reptile, and they, these are babies, probably born a couple of weeks ago, maybe even this week, and they'll get to about the size of my index finger as an adult. What we want to do on the island here is we're looking at trends, so we want to see how many animals we see every year how many juveniles we see. And then when you look at that over time, you can see whether the population is stable or whether there's a natural fluctuation in the population. These are specifically put out for our research so we can draw the animals in to use them for a heat source. And then we can take identif uh, identification photographs of the adults of their underbelly with the scales because each, each adult has a unique pattern of belly scale. So we'll use them. This guy is probably about maybe because he's not jet black and he's, he's slightly bigger so he's probably about a week old like they, they lose the jet blackness pretty fast and this these guys are, are, are probably a couple of weeks old already and um, the interesting thing with this guy here he's already got a scar on his head and he's dropped his tail and, and so is this so something's obviously tried to eat this fella at once but that scar will remain there the black scar so we can use use that as an identifier as he gets older that's that's very unlikely to heal so that it completely disappears to, so, so that we wouldn't be able to ID it again. The important thing about these <coughs> mats is what we tell members of the public is not to disturb them because the more they're disturbed the, the less the lizards will use them and the less we get information on the lizards are numbers wise see if they're going up in numbers or going or staying steady or going down. Isn't that amazing guys? So that's in Dublin so we do have them see I wasn't making it up 
do you see the way they drop their tail? If there's something chasing them, it's a way of protecting themselves. They drop their tail off and whatever is running after them goes after the tail. Isn't that pretty amazing? Okay, now our little pollinators, our bees, and I know loads of schools are doing fabulous work, or our pollinary, I thought Tim from the tier, our lovely pollinators, our, our butterflies, our bumblebees, hands up, who's heard of solitary bees? Not you, Dean. Not many of you, exactly. Oh, I know you, Eleanor and Dean. But do you know, not many people have heard of solitary bees. And most of our bees in Ireland are solitary, which means they live on their own. They don't live in hives like the bumblebee. And the solitary bees, the mining bees, live, they make their little hole in the ground. To see this picture I have here with a red circle around it, that's a solitary bee hole. And they love bare soil. So in your schools, if ye leave banks of bare soil, facing kind of sunny directions, you're going to get little solitary bees making their homes in there. That's amazing, isn't it? Okay, you all know about these birds, but you don't all know the names. And a nice thing to do to get lots of birds to come into your school or your garden is to put up lots of different kinds of food. Most people don't think of that and they just put up bird seed. So if you put up Niger seed and sunflower hearts, and um, bird seed and fat and peanuts, you're going to get loads of different birds coming in. Now, birds of prey, we do have them in Ireland. And in fact, they're doing very, very well. This big guy on the right, the buzzard, is becoming more and more popular. I'm going to show you something amazing about a peregrine falcon, which is a bird of prey that we have in Ireland. They are the fastest flyers when they're going after their prey. And I'm going to show you something absolutely amazing about these guys. Okay, The true superpowered king of speed is about to clobber one of these pigeons. A peregrine falcon may chase a pigeon in one of two ways. The first method is the flat out chase. Sometimes it works, but pigeons are fast too. And when jostling back and forth with a peregrine in this mode, prey will occasionally slip away. When this happens, the peregrine can recalibrate and switch to method number two. It's called the rapid stoop, the dive bomb. The attack begins slowly, then gradually picks up speed. Its wings tucked in, the falcon is approaching 200 miles per hour. It is now the fastest animal on the planet. Against this superpowered speed, the pigeon is defenseless. So I know that's a little bit sad to see, but it's also very spectacular. So last week we saw a bird that traveled the farthest in the whole world, 22,000 kilometers, the, the Arctic turn. And this week we've just seen the fastest bird, the peregrine falcon. Now we're going to be getting to the wildlife detective bit in a minute. We're just telling you a little bit, bit about all these animals. You saw these last week, some of our animals that live along our coast and our John Coe friend, our orca. 
for those of you who didn't see it, you can get a copy of this presentation afterwards and there's a little video. You just click on the link and it will show you a video from Ireland. I know. Oh, our little bat friends. I love these. Okay. If I was to come into your classroom and say I had a bat in my pocket, how many of you would go, oh my God! Or how many of you would say, yay! Hands up, who'd be the first? Saying, oh my God, no, they're going to fly my hair! Thank you for being honest. Thank you for your honesty. Okay. Did you know that Irish bats were this cute? Do you see the little nose? Aren't they the cutest things you've ever seen? They are tiny. We have nine kinds of bats living in Ireland. One of them lives only around the south and west coast, the, le the lesser horseshoe bat. All the other eight kinds live everywhere, okay? They're all this tiny. Put your thumb out. Put your thumb out for a sec. Now picture the little bat and he's sitting on your thumb and he's not even, he's not even the full length of your thumb. So the bats in Ireland, do they suck your blood? No, they eat insects. They don't, they have nothing to do with your blood. They eat insects. They come out at nighttime and they eat moths and midges. And you know, in summer when you get a bite and you're scratching your arm and your mama's saying, would you stop scratching? And you're like, I can't mom, it's so itchy. The bats, one of those tiny cute little dudes is going to eat 3,000. 3,000 of those a night. So do we like bats? Do they fly in your hair? Do they suck your blood? Okay, we like them. Where do all these animals that we've been talking about live? Everywhere, everywhere. In the ground, in flowers, in wet areas, behind ivy, in trees, in long grass. That's where they live. Okay, now to the bit where we're talking about poo. Okay. I'm actually going to come back to the video. I'm going to show you first the signs that you have to be looking out for to know if there's wild animals around. Are you ready? Okay, the badger on Brock. The badger uses the same path all the time. By the way, have you met my dogs? I forgot to introduce. This is a picture. This is Cody, the big black fella, and Sandy, the small one. That's them. Okay, I should have said that at the start. Badger uses the same path all the time. He is path loyal. He uses a little path around the edge of a garden or the edge of a field. So if you find a well-worn little path around the edge of a park, I bet it was made by a badger. Badgers are very clean. They make their beds more often than you do. They bring straw and grass into their set, which is their tunnel they live in under the ground, but they clean it out once a month, which is more often than some of you kids in terms of making your bed. They take out all the dirty grass and straw and they bring in fresh new stuff. Now, my favorite topic, the poo. It is a big pile. I took this picture in the Phoenix Park in Dublin. Uh, when was it? Two autumns ago. I had a class from Cabra and we found this amazing find and I got so excited. How did I know it was made by a badger? Well, because it's a big, huge pile. Badgers, remember I said they're very clean? They all go to the toilet in the exact same place. They have like a port loo system in the wild. They don't just go anywhere. Oh no, they all use the same spot. And so the pile gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's called a latrine. It's a very, very sensible way to do things. So that was the first thing. The second thing was I saw it had lots of seeds which come from berries and I know that badgers love to eat blackberries in autumn because that's when they're on the blackberry bush. These little funny hollows in the ground are called snuffle holes and they are made by the badger's snout. When they snuffle in the ground at night time looking for worms and, and bugs and all kinds of nice things. Lastly, a hole in the ground, if it's a kind of a, um, it's kind of a not, not a real shape, I guess is the way to describe it, okay? This is a fox den, 
it's got a proper shape and it's kind of tall because a fox is tall. The badger is kind of low and wide. So if you find a low, wide hole, that's been made by a badger. And last thing, see his, see his um, paw prints. It's the only paw print you'll find with five pads on the top and claw marks. One, two, three, four, five, and the claw marks. Okay, foxes. Or, <laughs> it's not a fox, Marie, that's a squirrel. How do you know if there's squirrels around? We look up and we look down. You're going to say, Mairead, come on, seriously. Like, you can always tell if the squirrels, I can see them, right? Not always. I went to school in Dalkey a couple of years ago and I said to the kids, are there foxes or, why do I keep saying foxes? Are there squirrels here? And they went, no, miss. No, haven't seen them. I said, are you sure? Come on outside. We went outside and we found. Oh, you know what I'm going to have to do? Hold on a second. Hold on a moment. I'm going to have to to stop the share for a second and then I'm going to have to go into changing oh no change my background coming I'm going to get rid of that now okay now you can see my house now you can see me okay do you see this see this thing I found those on the ground what on earth is that that is a half-eaten pine cone. Here's another tiny one. I'm trying to get it in front of the camera. This is not easy. Whoop. See that? There's another half-eaten pine cone. And the reason I th knew that that was eaten by a squirrel was because that's what they do. Here's another one. See the left at the bottom. It's like eating an apple. And we leave the middle of the apple. Squirrels the same. So I said, well, I know you didn't see the squirrels, but I know we have them because we're after, eating, we're after finding half-eaten pine cones. That's one way of knowing there is a squirrel. The other way is you look up. And if you see where they live, which is called a dray, then you know there's a squirrel there. And you say, Maraid, what's a dray? Have a look at these pictures. A squirrel's dray is full of leaves. Whereas a bird's nest is full of twigs. See the difference there? Okay. Foxes and fox poo. Do you remember I showed you a picture of my two dogs? Do you know what they love to do when I bring them for a walk? They roll in it. And yesterday I had to give them both a bath. Because guess what? They rolled in it. Okay. There is lots of fox poo around. You'll definitely see it after today when I describe it to you and you're like, Marie, too much information. It's not, it's really fun. Okay. A fox poo is generally squiggly. Ah! See, it's got a squiggly shape. That's, of course, unless it was smushed in the ground by someone's foot. Okay. It generally is black, not brown. And it will nearly always have visible the things the fox ate. So this one down at the bottom has hair in it. So that could have been from a rabbit, rat. And it's got seeds. Because do you remember I said they're omnivores? So it was also eating berries. And this one here, do you see those little black shiny bits? They are beetle shells. So now I bet you, you're going to be going out now and looking on the ground at all the poos and checking out what's in them. See, it's hard not to. Next thing. You know when you find a big pile of feathers on the ground? Now, I'm not talking one or two. I mean a big pile, like this picture up here. That means that a bird got killed by something, okay? The web of life. It either got killed by another bird, like a magpie or a bird of prey, or it got killed by a fox. How do you know which? Look at these feathers in this picture. I want you to look at the ends of the feathers. You know the pointy bit of the feather that people used to write with, that they would dip in the ink? Can you see the point on these feathers? They've been chomped off. They're kind of flat. There's no pointy bits. When a fox kills a bird to eat it, it just goes, chomp and it 
jumps off the feathers and hop, 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 eats the bird. The feathers look like this. Okay, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Last thing about foxes and paw prints. This is mainly for the older kids. And I know you can follow this. If you find a paw print in wet ground, remember I said that Badger has five obvious pads at the top. Look at these three. Don't mind the red X's for a minute. The cat is small. It has no claws because when it walks, it walks with its claws retracted, pulled back in. Okay, that's the first thing. No, no claws and small. Move on to the dog and the fox. How do you know if it was made by a dog or a fox? Okay, dogs are generally wider than a fox's. That's kind of hard to tell though. This is where I'm going to describe the X. If you find a print on the ground, in your brain, I want you to draw an imaginary X across the print. If you can draw the X without touching a pad, do you see there, see that X isn't touching a black pad? That's a fox print. Do you see this? No matter what way I draw that X, it keeps hitting a pad somewhere. That's a dog print. Isn't that kind of cool? Now, the last thing is the den. Remember I said foxes are tall? So generally, it'll be tall. It'll be high. Okay. Hedgehogs. Remember I said about the hedgehog survey? Teachers, look that up. National Hedgehog Survey. Some cool things for you to be doing in your school. I used to never describe how to find hedgehogs because it can be tricky because they just make their homes really under big piles of leaves. And that kind of can be hard to tell unless you find a nice little circle at the front with a little sign saying, I live here. Then one day I was out with the school. And we found these poos, more poos. They were tiny. I thought, you know what? It was a kid that found these. And I thought, let's talk about this. Put your little finger up. The hedgehog poo is tiny. It's half the size of your little finger. Okay. And look closely. It's full of little beetle shells. Do you see these shiny blue and black bits? Full of them. So if you find a tiny little poo, half the size of your little finger, full of those little black shiny bits, you've got a hedgehog. Okay. Back to our bats. Okay, how on earth do you know these bats? And I know you want to know, now that you know how cute and gorgeous they are and that they don't suck your blood and they don't fly in your hair. Okay, how do you know they're out? Because it's at night time and it's sometimes hard to see them. I know some of you have seen them, but not everybody. Okay, the first thing is you can use a bat detector. Okay, these are cool. You can get them on Amazon. Okay, and you can look up teachers. You can Google how to use them. What they do is they let you hear the sound of the bat. Because we can't hear bats' calls. Because they call really loud. So our ears can't hear it. But this little gadget allows you to hear it. And each bat has its own kind of call. Listen to this. I'm going to, I'm going to play a video of a Dobenton's bat, which is the water bat. And it's somebody using a bat detector to listen to the sound of a bat. So you're going to hear a sound like marbles rolling on a floor. And that's the Dolbenton's sound. Listen. What this device is doing is picking up the very, very high-pitched calls of bat, way beyond the range of human hearing, and interpreting it. Oh, here they come, here they come, here they come. Yes, you can just pick them up now on the thermal camera. Door bent on the bats. These are the water specialists. They fly incredibly low over the surface of the water, dangerously so, you think. But because they occupy this very narrow band of airspace just off the water's surface, they get first pickings of insects as they emerge, as they hatch. Here they come. Two of them. <laughs> Three, more. Ooh, ooh, oh, chasing each other. All oh, right, Crosby, lovely. I wonder how Jamie's getting on. Hopefully, the infrared. 
Isn't that cool? So do you see the way it works? It lets you hear the bat sound. So there's other ways, and I won't go into it hugely, and I have notes written on this for teachers. You can read it out afterwards. You can see you're looking for signs outside. So bats tend to like to live in attics. If they can't find an old tree that they can roost in, they'll go in into an attic, and you don't even know they're there. And so they'll fly in as close to the roof as they can. And they will often leave, again, droppings. I'm always talking about droppings on the wall. They will also leave like a dirty mark because they're moving in and out all the time. Um, they will, if you're lucky, you might find a pile of moth wings on the ground. And that's because they are also very picky eaters, a bit like the squirrel leaving his apple core behind. These guys spit out the wings of the moth. They don't like them, they spit them out. So sometimes you find a pile of wings. And the last thing, of course, I have to talk about the poo. If you find a pile of this in your attic, it's not made by a mouse. And I'll tell you how you know the difference. For starters, mouse poo is stinky, okay? This doesn't smell of anything. You won't smell it. Next thing, and you're going, oh, Maraid, I'm not going to do this. Get a pencil and squish it, okay? You're like, oh! Do you know what happens? It just goes into dust. It's not gooey or wet or anything, it just flakes into dust, goes poof. So that's the difference between mouse poo and bats. And look, it's also full of little beetle shells. See all those shiny bits again? Okay. Our lovely birds of prey, I'm not going to go into them in huge detail, but I do want to show you, remember I said about the fox and big piles of feathers and how the fox chomps off the feathers so there's no point left on them. Birds, are different. If it is a bird of prey or a magpie that has killed that bird, it will pluck the feathers out first before it eats the bird. So when it plucks them, it means the points are left on the feather. See, the point is still there. That was killed. That bird that left those feathers was killed by another bird. Okay. I'm going to show you a little bit about, um, nope, that's not how we do it. We go into a new share, don't we? We are going, I'm going to show you, I'm going to bring you on a nature walk. Pretend we're outside today, guys. And you can hear the birds. So we're going to go on a walk about, and I'm going to skip through bits of this every now and then, okay? Because there's another video at the end I want to show you, which is just magic. My name is Mairead Stack and welcome to St. Anne's Park in Dublin. So today we are going to be looking for tracks and trails of wildlife. And you might think, what kind of wildlife is in Dublin City? There is a lot of wildlife in Dublin City. But we're particularly looking for signs of mammals today. So squirrels, foxes, badgers, and whatever else we see along the way. So when you're out and about, the main thing to do is to keep your eyes open and look up and look down, look around, and you soon get your eyes into what you're looking for. So come on and let's take a walk and see what we find today. In Dublin City, there are loads of pocket parks, which are small little corner parks. There's medium-sized parks. You're never very far away from somewhere green, somewhere with trees, and somewhere with wildlife. So you might be thinking, where do you even start looking for the signs of wild animals? So the first thing to do is trying to figure out what can we expect to find? So we have a number of mammals, which are like us, milk producing animals in Dublin. So we'd have bats, we have badgers, we have squirrels, we have foxes, and then we have our little insectivores, our hedgehogs. And all of these leave specific signs behind them. They're all very elusive. Now, if you're looking at me now, you can see that I'm looking down. And right now, what I'm looking for under this beautiful horse chestnut tree is signs of a badger. So badgers live in sets under the ground in amazing complex tunnels. 
And they have beautiful long snouts, which they use to snuffle in the ground, looking for grubs, insects, and also maybe some seeds because they're omnivores. They will eat a lot of different things. They eat mushrooms as well. So they snuffle with their noses. So this kind of place is a good spot to start. You've got lots of bare ground under the tree. You have loose leaves and, and a lot of little twigs. So if there were badgers here last night, you'd see their snuffle holes, which are little hollows in the ground under and around the tree. So let's have a look and see if we find any. So something like this. Again, when you're coming out for the first time, it's tricky to get your eye in. And it's often easier when the ground is wet because you can see the dark soil where they've been rooting around. But I'm looking here and I can see a few things which might be snuffle holes. So here, and here are literally little wedges in the ground that are wedge, wedges into the leaves. Sometimes they're much more obvious than that and they're actual hollows that have been scraped out. Let's have a look up here. So here's another one. Again, it's like a wedge down into the leaves. It's potentially a snuffle hole. You can sometimes be very lucky, again, if the ground is wet, and see signs of their claws, where they also use their claws to dig and look for what's in the ground. So we'll keep going. And while we're talking about badgers, as you can see, I'm looking down, looking for these snuffle holes. Badgers leave a okay, lot I'm going to speed forward a little bit behind. here because we've talked about that already. Okay, what is it? Which is used by the whole community of badgers in the area. So in here I'm looking at a path that's making its way through here. So let's have a look and follow. Remember I path. said they use the same path all the time, so that's what we're following here. So if you can see in front of us, there is a path in the ground. and it's following the edge. And it's more than likely, and here's some digging signs as well. So we could have stopped, snuffled and dug and looked for some grubs here last night. So let's keep walking along and see what else we find, if the badger left any other signs behind him. So here in St. Anne's Park. Okay, we're talking about squirrels there, and you all know we were talking about that. That you can sometimes, actually usually find half-eaten pine cones. It's like when you're eating a corn on the cob. You get to the middle bit and then you leave the middle bit, you don't eat it. Well, squirrels are the same. They'll eat the outside of the pine cone, but leave the middle bit. So let's look and see if we see any signs of squirrels. Well, straight away, there's definitely pine cones. And right here, this one, and I have another one here, you can see that it's been partly eaten. So we know that there have been squirrels here. Let's see if we find another one. Okay, let's speed on again. We've done all the squirrel stuff. Gets good now. We find some cool stuff now here in a minute. Now you might think, why do I think that was made by an animal? Well, there's a couple of things. It was a hole that I saw. At. First, it's got a distinct kind of shape and the vegetation is kind of growing around it. Let me point it out. Do you see that? This is sticky back or cleavers and there's a definite resting place going on here. So how do we know what's been using this space? First of all, is it being used? If we find a hole like this and there is no cobwebs over the front of it, that means there is an animal coming in and out all the time. So I think this is being used. Is it a badger or is it a fox?
So just think about the shape and size of the animal. Foxes are tall and thin, badgers and wide. So let's have a look at the shape. It's tall. If it was made by a badger, it would be much lower down here. So I think a fox has been sheltering here. It's not, it's not necessarily den, but it's, I think, a definite sheltering spot that has been used frequently by a fox. So children love a few things, and one thing they love more than anything is talking about animal poo. I work in schools, and I go in and I say to the kids, cover your ears, teachers, cover your ears, because I'm going to start talking about poo, and the kids love it. The poo of wild animals tells us everything. It tells us, first of all, what animal was there. It can tell us what food they're eating. It tells us where they've traveled to, because you might be able to find different plants or animals in, in that. And you might only find those plants and animals, let's say, in three fields away. It tells us if the animal is a male or a female. It tells us if that female has young at the moment because of hormone levels. So, as zoologists, which I am, we are always on the lookout for wild animal poo because it tells us so much about the animals that are in an area. So as we're walking along, I'm always on the lookout for fox poo. And it tends to be left in open green spaces like this. They're not as particular as badgers. They're not as clean or as private as badgers. They don't mind where they go. I know this sounds disgusting, but it doesn't smell. And you're thinking, how on earth do you figure that out? Well, even if you were to just crouch down beside it, if that was made by a dog, you'd know straight away. You could smell it. Fox poo doesn't have that horrible smell. And you'll see seeds in it. You'll see bits of bones. You'll see feathers, you'll see maybe some, some hair, because foxes are omnivores, they eat everything. They eat mushrooms, they eat seeds, they eat animals, they eat everything. So... Okay, we're going to move on. I'm looking for fizz. Woo! Same path all the time along the edge. So we're going to see if we find one. And straight away, in all this old leaf litter, I can see what looks like badger snuffle holes. So here, and further in, here, and now that I'm here, I can see a well-defined path through the ivy on the ground. And it's not a, I know it looks narrow, but if you were to imagine a fox or a badger, foxes walk in a very defined movement. They literally put one foot in front of the other. They know where they're going. Unlike a dog, a, a, a domestic dog, which stops and sniffs all over the place. So a fox path, first of all, they don't use the same path, but also it's very narrow. This one isn't so narrow. It's a bit wider. So you can imagine a broad badger working his way along here at night time. It's nice and safe. It's along the edge of this green space. So let's follow this path and see where it leads. And here we can see it leads to more well-defined pathways. So I think this is a very well-used badger path right here. So here the badger path is getting wider. So I'm just going to follow it and see where it leads us. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is a very unusual find. I'm after finding some badger hair. And more. So I think this is definitely a badger path. You see the black and the white? That's fantastic. 
Okay, so you get the picture. I think you guys now, if you were to go out into a park with your teacher, you'd be well able to look for tracks and trails. Would you know what to look for now? I think you would. Okay. Ray, that's yes. amazing. I have to say, I really want to get outside now and do some detecting. I know. Because I, I know. think I might be able to do it, but I'm not too sure. So I know I don't want to inundate you, but I really, really want to show this. It's two minutes long. Okay. So there was, there was a big conference two years ago on wildlife in Ireland, and they made this video especially for it on Irish wildlife. And I just, it is absolutely, it'll change your life. It is so magic. This is the wildlife around us. It'll take two minutes and just sit back and watch it. It's really unbelievable. goodness oh my goodness that's phenomenal that is oh my goodness that's a real treat thanks for sharing isn't it so amazing we're all going to be going out now and looking for our amazing irish wildlife isn't it fabulous now Mairead, um this is the part where we <laughs> ask you questions and i'm just going to tell you now before we get a flood of extra ones and we've already got 27 so we're gonna to have to kind of keep our answers short if okay i'll be fast i'll be okay. fast so um but we also need to speak <laughs> so first question from elizabeth maloney why do the toad lay its spawn in lines i think it might have been the newt that was laying it in lines it's, wasn't it no it was the toad was it the natterjack, was it, the natterjack? Yeah. it was the natterjack toad oh, you're right. absolutely right it's just that their bodies are different the frog's body and the toad's body are slightly different, and that's just the way they come out. There's, I don't think there's any other reason, to be honest. Yeah. Interesting. Good one. So, uh, Eleanor, do you have a question there? Yeah, there are so many questions about badgers. So a lot of them are about how do they see? Can they see in the dark 
why do they come out at night and do we ever see them in the daytime? So we always look at an animal's body and it tells us what sense they use the most. So their biggest part of their body is their snout, if you know what I mean, their biggest sense. They have small ears and small eyes, which means they don't use their hearing really and they don't use their sight really, they use their smell. So they use their sense of smell to find food in the ground. They come out at night because it's safer for them. And we sometimes see them during the day, but very rarely. Okay, and what do they? Am I going? Am I going fast? No, slow no. Enough? Listen, I, 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 there was a query at that last video. Is it available to view? Um, because obviously, um, people want to see that again. And I just said yes. all the links are going to be shared. We're going to be sending yes. out the email. Yes. Sorry, talk slower. Sending out yes. an email. Sorry. Um, uh, there's another one here um, from Maria Goretti Serlis, um, and it's about poo. Sorry. Um, so why do dogs roll in poo? Yes, so the, the dogs roll in fox poo because of the pheromones, the hormones in the fox poo. Um, so my little dog Sandy yesterday went crazy along the canal. Every bit that she found, she rolled on it. I think certain times of the year, the fox poo has more hormones than others and okay. the dogs can smell it. Fantastic. Uh, Miss, I'm just going to ask one more, sorry, because I know this one came through and it's uh, Miss, from Mrs. Langrell. Um, how close do you have to be to be able to hear the bats with the detector? That's a good question. Uh, you can actually hear them from quite a distance. You mightn't hear the sound very clearly, but you, you'll be able to pick it up. Yeah. So we're talking 50 yeah. metres or? Yeah, you can. Yeah. 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 Okay. Wow. Okay. Eleanor. We've got a big hello from third class in Gainstown and Mullingar, and they would like to know if foxes and badgers are colourblind. So I, I can't speak for badgers. I would have to look that up. Um, dogs, I believe they don't have the same spectrum of colours and foxes or dogs. I believe they would have a more limited, I don't think they're colour blind, but I think they have a much more limited spectrum of colours than we can see. I would have to find out about badgers. So. Yeah. Uh, Kira Hullohan is asking, where can we see peregrine falcons? And I'm pretty sure um, there are some in Dublin. There's, there's a nest um, near Dublin Port. There is on the Rings End Towers, Rings and the, towers the stripy yeah. ones. Um, they, they nest up, so naturally they will nest on cliffs, but in towns and cities they will nest on up high on buildings. Wonderful. Okay. Fantastic. So we have a hello from Miss Calvi's wildlife fourth class in Skilvera, Carrick and Shannon. And they're really interested to hear of any strange or interesting wildlife that they should look out for by the Shannon. Is there anything special down there that they yes. should be keeping their eyes open for? Yes. Keep your ears open for corn cricks. So the corn crick is really an endangered bird in Ireland. And it is it loves to hang out on the Shannon Callows. So there is a fabulous conservation programme in Ireland about corn crakes. So Google that and you will get all the information you need about how to listen for them, what to look for. This one might be a difficult one to answer, but it's from Roisin in third class. And um, what is the estimated population of red squirrels? Now, maybe you can talk about the counties that they're in. So, so I will tell you something uh, and I'll try and be fast. They, they were declining a lot in Ireland. They were doing very poorly. And then something amazing has happened in the last two years. Um, there is an animal in Ireland called the pine martin and it gets a lot of bad publicity, which is not true. Like bats, people say things about bats that are not true. They don't know the science. So you have to follow the science, okay? Pine martins are actually not carnivores. They are omnivores. They will eat everything. They are called in Irish uncut cron, the cat of the tree. And they are beautiful. If you watch that last video again, they're the lovely black animal that's playing on, a bit like a stoat, I suppose, but playing on the trees. Um, they have been doing quite well in Ireland over the past few years, and they tend to eat grey squirrels. And so they are managing to control the population of greys. So the red squirrels are doing well. And the reason is, this is all about biodiversity and how things work together. The red squirrel and the pine marten have lived in Ireland for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So the red squirrel has learned to watch out for pine marten. And babies are now born knowing already that pine martens are bad. Okay, that they're going to eat them. Ray squirrels have only been in Ireland since 1914. They haven't yet learned about pine martens. So 
they're hanging out, eating their pine cones, and there's a there's a there's a there's a, a pine marten, and he eats them because they're like, I don't know, I didn't know I was to be worried about him. That's where biodiversity works. Fantastic. That's, yeah. Um. We're getting massive, massive, massive comments from people who are saying thank you in the chat. And some people are heading off because they're going to break, uh, which is a shame. And I know it's 10.30. I hope you don't mind asking one more question, if, if that's okay. So, um, wildlife class, fourth class, uh, skull wearing Caracol Shannon. They want to know what um, kind of special, interesting wildlife they might find nearby. I mean, is that something you would be able to share? So, Caracol Shannon is on the River Shannon. Okay, so this time of year, be looking out for lots of water birds. So you have coots, which are the beautiful little black bird with white beaks. You have water hens, which have little red legs. You have swans, you have all kinds of ducks. Um, you will also get beautiful insects flying over the Shannon, dragonflies, which have beautiful colored wings, and damselflies. So keep an eye out for all those wonderful. And if you get a chance, go down with the little bucket and a net, take out some of the little insects that are in the water and have a look at them. Google water insects and you'll be able to find out the ones that you'll see. Now, I wish we could have answered some more questions, but unfortunately time has beaten us. But what I would say, um, the, the links and the presentation will be shared by an email. And I know it's going to send out an email and there might be a follow up question there for you guys as well. But um, so you'll be able to see that presentation and all the links to the videos again. Um, and Mairead is available to come and visit your school. So, um, you know, uh, next, now next, that next year, next but, year. Yeah. And, yeah. but also, um, if you want Murray to visit you for a special webinar, that's possible as well. So, uh, and I believe it, you, they find you via Nature Clubs, Nature Cubs Island. Is that that's right? That's right. Yeah. Fantastic. So everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I enjoyed it as much as you guys, I'm sure. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. The next week's workshop is all about nature, arts and crafts. Do we need to bring anything to be able to? To be able I will to let this. you know. Uh, yes, I will. Well, I will put together a list. Put together a list. So we'll I send them out by list. email. Beforehand. I love my list. Okay. I will send them out. Yes. Fantastic. So everyone, thank you so much. And we'll see you all next week. Slon. Slon, Liv. Everyone, have a good Bye. day. Bye.